that's all. Um, so let me, I'm just looking around the room. So who, I wrote this talk as a general talk, which I wanted to be, but I just wanted to see who are not my math colleagues here. <laughs> Great, okay. But we have people on That's right, we also have people on Zoom. I just wanted to make sure, right, okay. So, I mean, there is some of the math content at the end, hopefully enough to give people a taster so you can ask me questions if you want, um, but I did not emphasize that part, all right? So, uh, you know, sometimes in the past I've called this talk uh, a, a, math, a nice mathematician goes to court. Um, you know, so how did I end up doing this as part of the story? But what I'm, what I'm gonna tell you about is this, this started around 2013 um, and it came with, a, I was at a talk at a, at a political conversation that was going on in my city. And um, at that time, one party had won just over 50% of the votes and they got, a, they got three out of, was it four or three that year? Three or four out of 13 seats in the sent to Congress. And so some people said, well, that's clearly wrong. It's, it's, you know, it's gerrymandered. And then they said, well, what does that? And then they said, clearly we should have gotten seven of the 13 seats, you know, just over half because we had just over half the votes. And it kind of started the scientists in me turning like, okay, and maybe that doesn't look like something's right, but why would you get seven? How did they know that? How do you make sense of that? And so it was somehow a talk about how to think about fairness maybe. And I think there's some, there's a nice melding of math and, and, and more humanistic questions here. And I think we, maybe we could say something together. All right, so what happens in our society is the people go to the ballot box and they vote, right? People come and they vote. And then we have districts in the United States. We, we generally have geographically centered political systems. So those districts elect a person like Rush Holt, right? So they elect someone and they send them to Congress, right? And um, this happens to be the North Carolina delegation at the time one of these conversations was going on. And, 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 and you know, when you read in the newspaper, the vote is somehow, we talk about this, this election results as the will of the people being expressed. But somehow the vote was really the will of the people. That was where they cast their vote. And there was an interpretation layer between these two things, which is the districts that were used in that election. And, and it was surprising to me to learn how dramatic the, the, the districts have an effect on the outcome of an election. And I, I, will, I will submit to you that in many situations, all the things that people usually talk about in voting fraud, whether it's dead people voting or you know, ballots being lost or you know, people who shouldn't have been able to vote, being able to vote, those are all like noise compared to the effect of who draws the districts, okay? So, so we have this map with this vote and it's mitigated by a map to who wins and we end up with some people elected. The point is you can take that same vote that I talked about and end up with completely divergent congressional delegations elected using the exact same vote. So different district maps, but given the same vote lead to divergent results. So somehow the will of the people didn't change at all. They voted, but then how we interpreted that well, the next day, how we interpreted that measure, that, that, me that message, that signal that they were sending to us completely changes the next day. And this is actually true. This is not just made up graphics. I can take a vote that we registered like this and I can make, flip it basically. I can flip it from nine, four to four, nine back and forth just by changing who, how I draw the maps, all right? And so, you know, the choice of maps seems to be as much of anything that determines the outcome. So our democracy has a lot invested in how we draw those maps. And it's not just who wins, it's something I wanna drive home to you, but I'll make that point later. All right, so how do you decide which map? So often when people have this conversation, they try to invoke some external fairness idea. They might say proportional representation, right? When you read in the newspaper, when I was listening to that person who gave that talk, they said, this group got this percentage of the vote, they should get that percentage of the seats. I mean, that's nice as an abstract idea that we might want to strive towards, or maybe we don't want to strive towards, right? Maybe we don't want New York and LA making most of the decisions for the country with the help of Chicago, right? I mean, maybe that's not what we want, right? We want some kind of distributed, geographically localized representation system. And so- Right. Yes. In different ways. Yes. Right. Yes. Right. All trains lead to Paris. Right. So, so um, but you know, it's kind of we interesting that people have this conversation and yet they're living in a system which was not at all designed to do that. 
So why should they hold that up as their metric to judge the outcome of a result? Similarly, people have ideas of symmetry. There's lots of discussion in the political science literature of, of ideas of symmetry. You know, what happens to me should happen to you when we switch places. The problem is you never really switch places. They talk about very large scale ideas. Like when you get 20, when you get 51% of the vote, or if I get 51% of the vote, the same thing should happen to us. But that 51% of the vote can be distributed completely differently spatially. And the fact that it's distributed spatially changes dramatically how it leads to people being elected. Right, so, so once we have this geographically localized system, to talk about symmetry is problematic also. And similarly with ideas of efficiency, there is efficiency gap and things like that. They also have a lot of, they have a, their own huge problems. All right, so while these might be desirable and maybe we should have a conversation, how should we design our system to better reflect some of these ideas? If you're trying to evaluate whether the system ran correctly and was used correctly, they're kind of tangential to the conversation. In my opinion. All right. So maybe, you know, so at some point when I was confused, I did what any good person might do, <laughs> showing your true level of confusion. You go to the dictionary and go, you know, what the heck does gerrymandering mean anyway? And this is the definition I found at that time somewhere. And I've highlighted two words to manipulate the district boundaries, to change the outcome. So somehow in this conversation, there's presupposing that you know what should have happened. And usually when people use this term, they know what should have happened because they've invoked one of those other principles, often proportionality, to say what they thought should have happened. So the question is asked then, what would have happened? I kind of want to reduce this question to first answering, what would have happened if there were no political agendas, if no one put their thumb on the scale, all right? There's no clock in this room, right? Okay. So maybe you'll give me like a 10 minute warning. All right, so, okay. So yeah, this is a discussion. All right, so, so let me just stop for one second and give you a small ad about why. So this, these ideas are finding traction now. When I first started off, no one cared. And somewhere along the way, there's a story, which I can tell later about how someone started to care about our work and other people's work, similar work that was coming out of the But we've been involved in a number of court cases. One of them went to the Supreme Court um, of the United States and, and the other ones, but they, in 2020, all the maps in North Carolina, the state house, the state senate, the congressional maps were all overturned based on the testimony using the ideas I'm about to explain. And those similar ideas now have been used by other groups in other places. So there's other groups using very related ideas, uh, but sometimes different, sometimes quite beautifully different, uh, like uh, the group at Carnegie Mellon has a different twist on these unrelated ideas. The group around West Pegden, if you know Wes. All right. so. What I want to do is propose a method for assessing fairness, which combines some kind of conceptual framework with then modern computational techniques, because there's a step in that process which you can't do, right? And that's in a way why those other ideas are attractive in the literature is because you can kind of reason it all out with pencil and paper or sitting over a dinner table, you know, sitting around a summer with your colleagues, right? You can have these kind of abstract discussions and you can invoke principles and then you can, you know, come to some conclusion. So I want to put a framework out there which necessarily is going to, in the middle, require some computation is done to, an to, to answer, to, to evaluate something that we couldn't evaluate by hand, but then use that framework to then evaluate the fairness, right? And I think that's an interesting question. So some colleagues of mine have been using similar questions to think about racial, racial polarized voting, to think about uh, school assignment, to think about, um, you know, uh, assessment of school districts, things like that, okay? All right, so, so in some sense, you know, often when you hear about gerrymandering, there's some idea of policy guideline laws that are implemented, but we really then, somehow there's this direct connection, they should reflect our societal values and our expectations. But what really is happening is we implement these and then we get outcomes and then we're upset somehow that, that, that these didn't give the answer we wanted, but we really should be maybe critiquing these, these policy decisions we made and the choice we made. So that's another thing with this conversation that we can bring to the conversation is we can help understand how this choice of rules, what it brings, what it, what it produces. And then we can have a conversation about how maybe we want to change that if, that's, if you don't like what it does. All right, so back to this slide. So <clears throat> what are the kind of general principles that people use when they draw maps? So these are the nonpartisan principles. So the district should be connected. Everyone in the room kind of nods, yeah, like duh. But 
go home and start thinking about what it means to be connected in Maryland. Are you gonna let bridges count? What about ferry crossings? How often does the ferry have to run before you? Whatever answer you come up with, I can promise you someone in Maryland over the last 50 years, they've used that principle at some level, right? Implicitly, they've done everything you can imagine and then what they did. Compact districts, I'd say they, look, they don't look like snakes or hot dogs, they tend to look more like circles. Roughly equal population, that's mandated by one person, one vote, right? The representative is the surrogate for a certain set of population. To put less or more people in that district is to give that group of people more voice. The Voting Rights Act, it's parts of the Voting Rights Act have been gutted, but other parts still exist and maybe we'll have new ones soon. Preservation of kind of municipal entities, preservation of counties, preservation of cities, and maybe other ideas of communities of interest sometimes to use or other ideas of pr protecting core districts if possible. These are all things that are used that have varying degrees of nonpartisan. The core districts is an incumbency is still has a partisan ring to it, but it's at the boundary. And you can argue about whether it's good for a state to always try to protect its incumbents to keep its power in the legislature. All right. So here I've given you three maps that were actual maps used in North Carolina elections. And if I was had more time, I might do the Sesame Street thing, you know, which of these is not like the other. And you know, if I did that, if you're honest with yourself, you would say that these two are the same and this one is different, right? The fact is, is that these two are the same and this one is different. Okay, politically, the way they interact with the geopolitical makeup of the state, and what I mean by geopolitical is where the people live, the fact that my state has a strange shape Right? You're, kind of, you're kind of forced to put a district somewhere right here. You can't do anything about that because there's this little wedge here. And then you know, there's, this is all water out here, so it gets complicated. Right? So, so you know, there's some, there's, those are all parts of the conversation. And if you don't take that into account, I, I state that you may have a hard time really getting to understand that. Okay. So part of the conversation is, I mean, you know, when you, people talk about gerrymandering, they often talk about crazy looking districts. Right? I, I want to convince you, I want to tell you that that's not true because these two maps are really politically identical, but they look completely different. I mean, it's like saying that, you know, if I come home and somebody's kicked down my front door, my house has probably been broken into. But if I come home and my door's not kicked down, it doesn't mean my house has not been broken into. There are lots of other ways to break into my house, okay? All of these have been used. Yeah, this is a 2012 map. Even the 2012 this was thrown out as a racial gerrymander because they claimed that they did this for racial reasons. And then it was thrown out because it, 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 they, there was an argument about how it was overdone in some sense. They disadvantaged that group by making them so concentrated. This was the replacement for that map, which was then went to the Supreme Court. And then that was then reheard in state cases because North Carolina Constitution has a clause that says elections need to be fair, which the US Supreme Court uh, Constitution doesn't have. <laughs> <laughs> and then they were all thrown out, and these were the maps. And I testified in these two cases in court. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, so you know, you look at those, and your natural inclination is to compare maps. So, kind of the, the basis of what I'm going to do is compare maps. So, I need some maps. So, here's some maps, and here's a bunch of maps that some nonpartisan, some bipartisan judge panel made up. They were all retired judges, and they decided to show the state that the parties could get along and do a better job. Okay, and this is the map they made. So there they are, you can compare them, but maybe it's helpful to have a few more maps, right? And you know, maybe it's helpful to have a lot more maps because you kind of want to have some idea of what's going on typically, right? That's kind of, I'm gonna use an idea of typicality as an idea of what fairness is, right? In other words, I'm gonna kind of invoke the principle that if you just follow the guidelines that you were supposed to end up with, you would almost certainly end up a map that looked like this. And if you end up a map that looks completely different, it's very likely that you followed some other guiding principle in selecting your map, even if you didn't tell anyone about it, okay? So I'm gonna kind of take the prescribed guidelines. I mean, it's true, I, I am not going to claim that I want to automate redistricting. I have ideas about how we might wanna redistrict, but I, I'm, I'm coming after the fact. You should not take this conversation as a conversation about how I am going to build you know, the, the redistricting computer and it's gonna spit out this roll of tape and tell us how to redistrict our states. And okay, that's not what I wanna do. There are inherently political externalities that are not written down in the guidance 
that have to always be taken into account, right? That's just, it's impossible to write down a perfect set of guidance. Okay. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a map and I'm going to take a certain set of votes that I have. Here the votes are in North Carolina. You see it's a very home heterogeneous state. I live somewhere right there. The very blue dot right there. In one election uh, for president, I think uh, downtown San Francisco had the most Democratic votes on some scale. The third most was Brooklyn, and the second most was Durham. So, all right. So here's the number of Democrats who were elected under that map. I could switch to another map. See, I switched this map. These all stayed the same. I got another. Like now, I elected. Eight. Now I elected a few more, and I can kind of flip through these maps. You see map five, map six, and I build up this histogram, and eventually I just keep going, and eventually this histogram stamp stabilizes, right? Because what I'm really doing is I'm, I'm really sampling from a distribution. So my policy considerations are going to go into some distribution, some probability distribution on the space of redistricting, which is a huge high dimensional space. And then what I need to do is sample that redistrict, that's that district, that, that measure. So I'm going to sample a high dimensional Gibbs measure on the space of redistricting of the state of North Carolina. And then I'm going to use techniques from computational statistics, computational statistical mechanics, computational chemistry to sample that measure in an effective way. Okay. So here's those maps. Now let me put those maps we just looked at. That was one of the maps we looked at, the 2016 one. So this says that under like maybe a couple tens of thousands of maps. This is the distribution of Democrats I saw elected. There's the map that we used in 2016. There's the map that when that map was thrown out was brought in to replace it, drawn by a special master. Here's all the other maps using two different sets of votes, 2012 and 2016. Here are the two maps we used. This is the remedy map, and this is the one that those judges made, right? I mean, it's striking. There's a real difference here. And when you look at that, you start to be able to make arguments. And those were the arguments that were made in court about how this map was really an outlier. Okay, now, but this is a very coarse uh, way to look at things. What might be more interesting is to look at this. So now I've done the same kind of histogram across a whole bunch of elections, and a whole bunch of elections. And um, I've organized them from the most Republican to the most Democrat. And not surprisingly, as the election becomes more democratic, this blue histogram shifts to the right, right? They, I'm, not, I'm not telling you where it should be centered. I'm just observing that as more Democrats, people, as more people vote democratic, more Democrats are elected under these maps. Now, what's interesting about the maps that we used in 2016, you see that it almost doesn't change, right? It's fundamentally non-responsive. And so now I'm gonna show you a movie. So I kind of, I show these kind of movies in court. Part of the conversation here is how do you effectively explain this to people also? And I spent a lot of time thinking about that. But the thing to notice is that this enacted map just sticks here. And the remedial map will slowly shift with it as the vote fraction goes up. And it kind of doesn't catch up until we're almost around 54, 55% Democratic vote. And that's well outside the range of what we see in North Carolina. North Carolina is a very purple state. We're always a few percentage points above and a few percentage points below, just depending on the year, right? There's a bunch of people, huge number of unaffiliated voters who change their opinion depending on what people are espousing, right? Okay, so here we can also talk about the state, uh, our state house in North Carolina, 120 seats now. The thing to notice with this one is, is that this is where the supermajority line, so at 48%, the Republicans typically get the supermajority in, in the legislature, right? So that's kind of interesting. It's almost a 50-50 split. I mean, it's pretty close, only two points off, right? But that's enough to have the supermajority. And that's just a function of our electoral system. And that's just what it should be, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your point of view. Yes? What well, does super majority Ah, it means two things. So 120 half is 50. And the 50 point, well, somewhere right over here, 48, I think it's like 60% of the votes. So what it means effectively is that the, the, the governor of the state can veto legislature, legislation. And if the, but they can override his veto if they have a super majority. The is what, 60%? It's something, I don't remember exactly, but it's 48 seats, something like that. Okay. So you can do the math. I think that might be 60%, I'm not sure. I'm, really, I'm not so good at it. Talk about, 
This is again the if under at 48% of the vote under using the presidential election as votes as a surrogate to for the election. This is the number of Democrats that were elected. This is the number of seats. Yeah, please ask lots of questions. Anyone want to ask another question? Yeah, right. So I'm psych and the votes are staying fixed. And I'm cycling over thousands, tens of thousands. Actually, in this case, a ridiculous number of maps because there's a very convenient product structure in this map. So I can actually get more maps. If I, I have the representation of my computer of more maps than the number of atoms in the universe, I think. Yeah. Yeah, we're coming there. That's part of the conversation. All right, so here we go. We're gonna run it. So now I'm gonna increase the vote share in, in a way that's reasonable. And as we get this, the blue histogram will shift to the right, yeah? And this, the, the map that was replaced, it moves with it. But we'll see that this overturned map will kind of stick right above this supermajority line. So in a way, it preserves the supermajority much longer. Oh, that one pops over. But different ones, they differ differently. And it's going to do the same kind of thing when it gets. So, so in other words, for, at some range of votes, some type of elections, it's a very good map. But it's almost designed that when it starts to shift, it really starts to lag behind. It really starts to underrepresent Democrats, as, especially as they break over into the majority. It takes much more to get over the majority with this map. Than a typical map would do. Just to clarify, the way that you're figuring out how, if there were 55% of Democrats in the state, how they would, how they would put themselves in the district is basing on votes. Actual yeah. votes. So what's happening is, so there's something called a uniform swing hypothesis, which is not perfect, but it's not so bad. Actually, it's much better than thing. And you shouldn't think of this as predictive. What the way I like to think of this is, these are like different probes that I'm using to probe the features of this map. So you take one spatial voting pattern. And you create a whole range of spatial voting patterns by shifting it up and down at the precinct level. And that changes the statewide vote graph. So you just shift everyone up 0.1% the votes in one direction. It's not the perfect hypothesis, but it's not the worst hypothesis. Actually, there's some real evidence that it's not the worst thing. But I'm not thinking this is predictive because what's really predictive is more are we in an election like X year or like Y year or like Z year? That's what really matters. Right? They're just a whole class of different spatial voting patterns we have in our time, and it really just is a question of what year are we in. That's what really changed the elections. All right, so here's the same kind of thing, and we see the same kind of non responsive <laughs> These purple dots came here for a long, long time, right? And then, and so they're kind of typical in this range, but as we go over to where the majority and the supermajority are in danger, as we go to more democratic elections, these purple dots lag really far behind. Okay, and maybe in the interest of time, I'll just skip to the next slide. Okay, so it was that just a fluke? Well, here are the maps that are currently proposed for the 2021 elections, right? You see this very strong non responsiveness. Okay, and I'll come back to that in a second. All right, and uh, here's a movie, same kind of movie. I'll just show you this again. So, this kind of effect that we see where, where a map acts quite reasonable. And then all of a sudden becomes unreasonable as a certain type of election situation arises is what we saw in Wisconsin. So we filed an amicus brief in the in the Gil, Gil case in when, when it went to the Supreme Court. And we, 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 we that's where we first kind of point out this type of what we call a firewall. Or some people like to call now a, 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 a seawall because there's like it kills the, the, the blue or red wave. Right, so as it shifts down to being in this case, I've plotted Republican. So this is more Republican up here, more Democrat down here. As it becomes more Democrat, all of a sudden the map starts to under elect Democrats in a dramatic way. And the effect is just to preserve the majority in the legislature, which is right there. All right, so these, if you've drawn a typical map, you would have ended up the legislature. Power would have switched here in these elections, but it wouldn't switch under the map that they're currently using. It, well, they were using that. All right. So I want to say that it, there's a lot of talk about seats, and I want to just point out that these methods can actually give some more information. So let me not belabor this. Let me just skip ahead. So what I have here is I have I've taken each of the districts, the 13 districts in North Carolina, and I've looked at just whatever the most Democratic district is, what was the fraction of votes that were in that district? And I plot in a little box plot here. So a box plot, for those of you who don't do a lot of data analysis, has a box that contains 50% of the data. And then these extremes are the max and the mean. And there's often a little quartile here, which I don't have. But 
So typically, you'd be right inside this box or right around it. And the map that those judges made is this green line, and the medians are the yellow line. And now, if you put the maps that we used in North Carolina, they look like this. And what's happening here is that in the, the districts that are more Republican and more Democrat, they put a lot more of the Democrats in the most Democratic districts as a way to pack them and nullify the effect of their vote, thereby decreasing the number of Democrats in, in the borderline Republican districts, and thereby making this huge jump. And this huge jump is really what we typically see in, in gerrymandered maps. That's what, that's what explains it, right? This huge kind of jump. All right. And there they were in the next maps. This is the other year, the map that we used in 2012. And the reason those two maps are politically equivalent it's because they basically had the same structure of their jumps. And so that really shows what's going on. All right. And this jump is also what explains this non motion here. All right. This, 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 the fact that the, when you change different election environments, there's essentially no response to this. So I want to make just one point. People talk about competitiveness, and I want to point out that competitiveness is really different than responsiveness. And I'd like to argue that we should talk about responsiveness. Competitiveness means you have as many districts as possible right around 50%. That's what I've done there, right? I've made all these districts, the number of votes I got was right around 50%. Those are all very competitive districts. The problem is, is that we go into a recession or the economy gets heated up and different people get happy. And all of a sudden the electorate shifts its mind a little bit. And now none of those ones are, are, are competitive anymore. And you have actually no competitive districts now, right? Which is not good. So what I would prefer is actually responsiveness, having kind of a general spread like this. So now all of these districts are in play because no one knows exactly what the, what the environment we're gonna find ourselves in and out on election day. And, and if we shift up a little bit, another set of elect districts become in play. And what's interesting is when you put this generic measure, this kind of nonpartisan measure on the space of your districts and draw maps, you typically end up with maps that look like that. That's a theorem waiting to be proven. It's something about order statistics and figuring out kind of the spacing here and the range is something which is not easy, but it's an interesting question. All right. Again, so here is the North Carolina districts that have been just proposed, and they are extremely non-responsive, right? Right. There's whatever, whoever you think should be in charge, or whatever you think you should get this many votes, or this many people should vote here, you should get this many seats. At very least, I think everyone could agree. That when there are reasonable swings in the political opinion, in the public opinion, somebody should win a seat, somebody should lose a seat. Right? And that's what's not happening right now. Okay. Right. So responsiveness to the election. It seems like <laughs> kind of the fundamental fact of a democracy, right? That that the outcome of the election should not be essentially pre-decided before the election day, which is what happens when you have extremely non-responsive maps. All right, we've done an analysis in Maryland also. I, don't, I decided to take it out for time's sake. How much time do I have left? Still almost three minutes. Okay, almost three minutes. I also want to make sure there are time for questions. I'm, I'm very happy to have a conversation. But let me, let, me, uh, well, you know, let me say a few more things. You can really dig into some interesting results here. So first, let me emphasize that these blue green dots do not follow this line of proportionality. They are not on top of that proportionality line. So we are in, in no way arguing about proportionality, right? The Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court got it wrong when this data was presented to him. Somehow they did not emphasize that in court to him, I don't think enough. And he said that all smells of proportionality. That's what the plaintiffs are, are at the end really talking about. And it, if you looked at the short transcript, I specifically said, we are not talking about proportionality. But anyway, you can also talk about packing and cracking. So, I mean, like and concentration of one, one group of people. So in Wisconsin, it's very dramatic. You know, the, 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 the Democrats tend to be concentrated in the very more urban areas, when you count Madison as an urban area. And then, you know, and, 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 and in the more less urban areas, there's, uh, there's, there's the, the Republican. And the effect of that is rather dramatic. Here, what I've done is I've asked, how would I have to take, and I took the voting pattern that was used in one election and another election, another election, and I shifted it map by map to ask, where would you have to shift it to what statewide vote fraction to get a 50-50 split of their, of, their, of their House of Delegates, all right? And you see it's actually often around 47. This one's almost 46. This one's more like 49, right? These are different vote, voting patterns. So sometimes the suburb votes this way. Sometimes 
you know, the cities vote exactly the same or sometimes they vote differently for different reasons. But what's interesting is, yes, so there is an effect of, of, of self-segregation, right? Part, certain people, like-minded people living together. But if you then look at the maps, you see that that self-segregation in no way explains the bias of these maps. These maps were biased on top of the natural self-segregation effect, right? And that's what's nice about this method is you can separate this out. All right, and you can also do more spatial things. And so this was an attempt to kind of localize who had been harmed, right? So you can ask yourself, so if you know anything about North Carolina, there's some very democratic places right there. And the fact is, is that they will never find themselves in a democratic district. It's just impossible, basically. That's what that did. So, they may be upset that they never win an election, that their candidate of choice never wins. But the reality is that's just the geospatial geography of North Carolina, that will never happen to them. But there are people who had an expectation that they should have been influencing the election, given where they live and how the maps are drawn. And these are all the people that found themselves in a district that was dramatically different than the one they would typically find themselves in, right? And you can kind of count up the people that were harmed. And then this is the map that the judges made, right? It's not surprising anyone who thinks about this, there's always, you can't fix everything. There's always someone who's a little bit out of whack from the average behavior, but, but, but not like this. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, it was harmful. I, I, I skipped the build up. There's a whole explanation thing. I just wanted to kind of give you some idea that you think about things spatially. All right. So now is where I kind of shift a little bit and tell you well, how we do this, but I'm happy to kind of take more questions on this part. I mean, one thing I'll just say is it's been really interesting to think about how I've learned a lot, you know, by talking to lawyers and talking to the political scientists and, and having interactions where both how I to explain what I'm doing, but also hearing the questions that they think about, right? It's really interesting. And then feeding that back into my work, feeding back, that back into what my team thinks about and trying to find the best. Well, I'll tell you the movies are the best thing ever. When I show the movies in court, I won't tell you who in the court is online shopping during the trial, but there are lots of people in the court who are online shopping. And when the movies are going, everyone stops online shopping. So I don't know if that's the best metric, but you know, it's not the worst. Go ahead. Is that something like you separate out the self-segregation? Well, what I'm saying is when I use these nonpartisan maps, these ones that are just drawn with respect to these kind of nonpartisan criteria, I get a certain, there is, if you are expecting, so when people say there is a self-segregation effect, the rest of the sentence, which I believe that they did not say, was there is a self-segregation effect relative to proportional representation, which I thought was what we were going to get, right? So there is the sense that you, you only need 40, you know, 48 percent of the vote Republican in Wisconsin to get 50 percent of the seats in the general Senate, in their in their state legislature, right? And that's because of the self-segregation effect, largely. Okay. No, I know, I know. I'm just saying that that represents what, what, what I'm saying is you should separate that should become what you should have expected. And then if something is different, it's not because of that voting pattern. It's not because of the salt segregation because we've already taken that into account in seeing that pattern, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, please talk. The what? Yeah. Yeah, so I was there. I was sitting quietly in the corner watching them as, a, as an interested uh, party. Um, they, it was very political. It was, you know, they, they, they had no political data directly in front of them, which meant that it could be a surgical. So they went on to leave the room, go look at a map, come back, say, you know, now that I think about it, can I just turn it a little bit like this? <laughs> you know, there's none of that. But they, but they were, they were all. These were all like retired Supreme states, like you had you know, North Carolina Supreme Court justices, many of them, or, or federal district court justices. They were all. Half of them were registered Republicans. Half of them were registered Democrats. They all been involved in their parties at various times. They knew where the bodies were buried, and they would say things like, "Oh, you can't take that away from so and so. They'll be really upset if that's not their district, right?" Right, because that's somehow part of what they think is their core constituents, right? So they had power, but then they had to make they had to make horse training. And at the end, they unanimously approved the map they came up with. Everyone was willing to live with the map they came up with. Actually, what they did was they split in half, they made two maps, two groups, then they came back and they argued about which map they all liked better, and then they voted and they they came to a consensus about which map they would choose. And the end they they voted, they they 
it came to consent through a series of straw polls and discussion. So these maps are drawn every four years? Uh, no, they're only when you have court cases. They're supposed to be mapped drawn in North Carolina, supposed to be drawn every 10 years. Like all things, that's true on average in the US, but like all things, there are exceptions. So there are states where if the map passes without the governor's approval or without any votes from the other party, then the map only lasts four years. I think that's currently true of Georgia at the moment. If you remember, there's, there's different, it's like, you know, like everything that I say across the whole United States is false somewhere in the US, right? It's just, a, that's a legal principle, I think. Unless it's in the US constitution, right, okay. So um, how am I gonna build these maps? Okay, so the simplest thing that any reasonable person would do first is to think about doing kind of what you might call an Ising mode, an Ising spin. So I'm gonna take a map, this is Iowa actually, four congressional districts, different colors, right? This is the graph of Iowa. So this is the adjacency graph of the precincts. There's an edge between two precincts if they're next to each other. I could take this, I could find all the edges that are between different colors, right? That, that, that are on the boundary. I could randomly pick one and then randomly pick a direction to permute this across. You can do all different flavors of this. You can do all different time This is what we did at the beginning. And you can iterate this over and over again, okay? Now, I'm gonna tell you in a minute, this is not actually what we're gonna do, but just to get started. Then this was a nice clever idea that, that down before Munduchin and Justin Solomon had when they started working at this field a couple years later. And this is a nice idea. It's kind of a global move. So what you do is you start off with two districts and you think of those as a partition of the graph into subgraphs, into embedded subgraphs. And you say, I wanna merge these two districts, the green and the pink, and into this purple district. And, and then I, what I do is I draw a random spanning tree on that. That's a very fast thing you can do. It's something called Wilson's algorithm in many other ways. You can draw a random spanning tree, uniform on spanning trees. So a spanning tree is just a tree which covers every vertex. Why is that good? It's because you can walk across it efficiently in order and time. And you can find where you could cut it to keep it basically equal population on each side. So then you cut it and you end up with two districts. That's a really nice idea and you can use that too. But the problem is that none of these methods are actually what we want. These are just two random distributions on the space that we just, on maps. We have no idea what they are really, right? I mean, one of them I do, it's uniform on partitions, the Ising one, because it's reversible. The other one's not even reversible. So you can't even tell what they are. So what we do instead, what we really want to do is have a, you know, a, a policy focused discussion and then write down what we care about and somehow embed that into our distribution in an explicit way. Yes, sir. Do you actually know that the random choice is generally different than the policy efficient? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. 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 I, I know that even more today than I did before. Weeks ago. What this also does is it focuses the policy discussion on describing the policy and the, and the distribution. It allows for independent verification because you have an actual target that you're trying to sample from. And it reduces the chance that there are unintentional biases introduced by the sampling algorithm. Okay. So, so kind of the steps in my mind, how I think about this, this process is first, we define some distribution, which encodes the law and the public policy, which I'm going to get to in a moment, the law and the public policy into this industry. Then we find some way to sample from this. And this is, and this is the computational part, right? So this is kind of the philosophical policy discussion up here, right? You can have a discussion up here. And then whatever you're interested in, what you, if you want to know what would they, right? The problem is, the problem that kept people from doing things in a way is that they'd have principles, but they needed to have a way to translate those principles into how maps should look. And what I'm saying is you don't have to decide ahead of time to require your principles to directly translate into knowing how maps should look. You can define your principles and then say, okay, now I'm going to observe what maps look like under those principles. And that's where the computational science comes in. I think that's powerful as kind of a, a paradigm for thinking about all different kinds of problems, right? I mean, people are trying to use this to assess racial, racial polarized voting and whether there should be a voting rights district in certain states and how much they are. Is it possible to build a coalition to represent a certain underrepresented minority in a way that's actually plausible and effective, right? Without just looking at the number of people in the state statewide, right? Which is kind of a very coarse way of thinking about it. 
And then you have to, the third thing which you can't skip is really you have to think long and hard about how do you explain this to people? I, I mean, I'm short shifting that a bit now. Um, so I'm, I'm, I think I'm hoping the room has somewhere, you know, people who think about quantitative stuff, whether they're social scientists or whether they're right, um, yeah, uh, physicists or mathematicians. All right, so, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take, I'm gonna define a probability distribution by weighting the probability of getting a certain partition will be some score, which you can think of as a, an energy, but I usually call it a score function and lower scores are better. And what I'll put into that score is a collection of different quantities that we like to measure. For instance, how well does it divide the population relative to the ideal population? What's the L2 distance squared between the current population and the ideal population? How compact is it? How many people are displaced from the district that has most of their county in it? So how many people are not voting with the rest of their county? How many people are not voting with the rest of their city? Does it, how close does it come to getting our target of a voting rights district? Okay, all these kind of questions. And we use things like the compactness score. Um, I use the isoparametric ratio. Uh, this was invented in the 70s by political scientists. Actually, the inverse is called the Polsby Popper score. Um, but apologies to Queen Dido, Carthage, right? Um, who maybe got there first. So, all right, so then, um, <laughs> you know, so then, right, we have the L2 distance. And we can also talk about very affinity scores. And, and, and um, we're for the first time starting to think about, you know, uh, uh, communities of interest in some for some of the states that are starting to use communities of interest more now as a as a as a redistricting criteria. All right, so now we have this measure. You may ask why did I choose this form? There's actually a really good reason to choose this form. If you pick these statistics, this is the maximal entropy measure with those statistics fixed. And so it makes sense to pick that. Okay, just, just an aside. All right, so I'd like to sample from that measure. So yeah, please. So it, 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 so that's something that we do in trial often is we try we change the coefficients a lot. Um, but you could also it's not something I've done in the past a lot. Um, now I think what I do more likely is I say like I will tune these coefficients to so that it looks like the map we're preparing to. So in these distribution, right? We'll tune it. Right to be close by. Right. The, the, like for instance, if I'm going to compare to the map that the legislature draws, I might tune this to look like that map in all the nonpartisan criteria that they use. Right, because then I'm answering the question: If I drew a map that looked like this, would it end up being like this map typically? Okay, so I mean, so this is a question, right? I mean, it's a good question. Right, but then it would change those statistics relative to their maps, right? I mean, it's not always a unique way to do this, but it's not so bad, right? So what we use is something called Metropolis Hastings, which you, if you don't know, you should go read about it. Um, it's a great thing. All mathematicians should understand the idea. It's, it's really cool. It's very simple. It says that you can take a Markov chain that samples a state space, however, in some way, and turn it into one that samples a state space in another way, under some appropriate assumptions. It kind of almost, almost with some mild assumptions, it almost always works. With without some stronger assumptions, it's impractical. Okay. And the way I, my kind of my thought experiment, how long do I have for it? Like 15 or 10? 10? Okay. A little bit more. So my extended metaphor for the people who aren't, you know, that used to think about this is if you wanted to do a sampling of restaurants in, in New York City. And you wanted to say, like, I want to know typically how many vegetarian dishes do they have? Or what's the typical caloric makeup of, of entrees? Or, you know, various questions. You make it up what the price point is for their, if their beef dishes that they have on the menu. You pick something you're interested. So one way I might do that is I might leave, you know, I might leave my office wherever I happen to be. You know, I, I, I leave Kron, NYU, and I spin a little dial. And I see which direction it points me. And I walk that direction until I plausibly hit a restaurant, right? As best I can, you know, deflecting somehow. And then I write down the statistics of that restaurant. I spin again, I do that. Maybe I live in Queens and I do it another day. I do it for my house. 
course, initially, I mean, a very different distributions, probably. Uh, probably then, you know, I live out in Sunnydale or something, right? And then I, I end up mixing together. But if I do that long enough, I'll, I'll get the same distribution, probably, if I do this overall here. On the other hand, if my friend has a really smarter idea, you know, they pay a, U, a, a Lyft driver 50 bucks to ride in their front seat all day. And every time they pick someone up, they look at the nearest restaurant, they write it down and get the statistics from that restaurant and just use the lift to go all over town, right? That's a great way to sample quickly all of New York City. Of course, it will probably be heavily biased towards the airport and restaurants near Penn Station, right? And restaurants near Grand Central or near the universities or you know, places that people tend to come from out of town and show up at. So, so you know, the question is though, that's a really nice mixing walk that goes all over the city rather quickly. Right? So you might want to be able to turn that sampling method into the other sampling method. And that's what Metropolis Hastings does. And it does it by, in, by, by enforcing local detailed balance. Okay? So there's a whole bunch of different methods that people have been using for a while. So when we first started off, we were actually using simulated annealing and the single node flip because we couldn't really, it didn't mix well. And then some genetic algorithms and recon came along. And as you move this way, these are really the methods we want to use. These are the methods we want to use because they're they are uh, they're they sample from a known measure and we can really they're real they're true Monte Carlo methods they really sample from what we know. And one of the versions that we now use okay so I won't explain this but there's a subtle you can't make this tree thing I talked about reversible easily it's very computationally expensive but by lifting up to some outstanding trees which I'm not going to get into I can explain later on time by revert by changing this we can actually make it so we can calculate the backward area, errors efficiently. So that's a recent paper a couple of years ago that, that my group at Duke came up with was a way to modify this to make it reversible so we could use it in the metropolis Hastings scheme. And now we're using it, and the reason that the variant is the one math slide, the reason is, is that at the end of that thing, if you don't do it the way we do it, there's a mini to one map and you have to invert this mini to one map to go backwards. And that's super expensive. So we stop here when we have low maps that are set, that are much closer closer, they have much lower rank. This one's horrible. It's a many, many, many to one. It's a huge curve, right? It's horrible. All right. So now the kind of thing we're doing is we've switched to thinking about things on a multi-scale graph level. So we're kind of doing multi-scale algorithms. So what we do is we take the fine scale precinct graph, and in some places, even the census block graph, and then we have the county graph on top of that. And what we first do is if we want to merge two districts, like this one and that one, we merge them. And then we first draw a spanning tree on the county level and cut it. And then we refine where we need to refine and sample that. And we can do this all in a way that's reversible. And so that it ends up with a nice multi-scale representation of our, of our things. And, and this is a nice algorithmic way of thinking about it. All right, and here it goes, just to show you it running. This is obviously a movie. It's not running real time. The M1 is fast, but it's not that fast. All right, so, and actually to be honest now, to do the things we wanna do, cause we really wanna sample from a very, sometimes these constraints get very stiff and we get, it's hard to sample. We actually use large scale parallel tempering and, simu and, uh, and simulated tempering, but mainly parallel tempering now. So we run at many different parameter values and these are the ones we want. These are the ones that mix well and we slowly increment these parameters and there's a way to have processes that swap between them, right? And, and it's, this is an interesting kind of computational statistical mechanics technique used a lot in chemistry and other places to sample at different temperatures. It's quite beautiful. Um, and we've, uh, and you asked me if these measures were the same. Uh, if you count sample from tree space, there's a number of trees that come up on a certain district and the number of trees can change dramatically from one district to another, even if they both would be pretty nice politically. And that leads to them not being picked as often if they have lots of trees. Hi, my name is Mauro Mattei, and I'm the founder of Bee Advisors uh, department. We are at one room, and today we'll have a closer look at the latest listing on rsquare.io. Oh, okay. Orange. That's not for All right. All right, yeah, please. And we also did some non reversible stuff. So, yeah. Because you have to be able to implement Metropolis Hastings to let you sample from any distribution, you have to be able to calculate both the forward and the backwards probability. So I don't care if my chain is reversible. If you know that a chain is reversible with respect to a certain measure, you know that that measure is then the stationary measure for that chain. 
that's like three lines of platform. I can show you if you don't know that. However, if you have a proposal chain which is not reversible, you can still use it to make a metropolis a reversible cha chain that has the right invariant measure, as long as you can calculate the forward and the backwards fluxes. Right? I mean, it's just intuitive. The reason your a state is a chain is, is kind of in equilibrium is one way for it to be in equilibrium, it doesn't have to be true, is that you have some probability of being here and then leaving there, and the same probability of being that place and coming back. Right? Um, we've done some non-metropolis. Monte Carlo methods, for those of you who are really into things like that. We've tried it, we've written some papers. Um, they're not as good as what we're talking about here. All right, so let me start to close up. Um, so I'll tell you that, I mean, you know, good problems lead to, this is something I believe very strongly. Good, good applied problems lead to good new math. And already there's lots of interesting questions that have come up, everything from how you sample certain types of standing force, and if, you know, and what is even the sample, what is the stationary distribution of, it, some of these things, what, 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 what is the structure of the spanning force more? You know, why, how, we've, we've already started developing new parallel tempering schemes uh, inspired by what we need for these problems, All right? And, and there's lots of other people doing interesting work. So there's some really nice work that started with Maria, what Alan Fries and Wes Pegnet, um, and they don't need convergence Markov chains. They can just, there's a criteria for, for testing the significance without mixing and, uh, Wes and I worked together with them to help adapt this to the a particular structure in North Carolina that we need, and to, we, we thought of some shorter proofs. Um, and this was actually used in the Pennsylvania and the North Carolina cases in court. Um, there's been some really clever uh, exact enumeration schemes to count the number of districts exactly, to enumerate them, actually not just count them, but enumerate them for reasonable size settings. And we actually used it in case, we actually in court presented this picture where we showed how our sampling method compared to exact enumeration in a, in a certain county cluster, which is of interest in North Carolina. And when, you know, so we actually showed an, a state-of-the-art enumeration scheme result in court to convince the court that we knew what we were doing. Uh, and that's, that was in Common Cause v. Lewis. Um, there's, there's some really interesting topological data analysis going on and uh, some kind of sequential Monte Carlo methods from Kazuka Inama at Harvard. Uh, there's lots of interesting work um, about how to think about, I like this paper in particular, about how to think about the Voting Rights Act and empowering underrepresented minorities, how to think about it in a better way than had been done historically by using these same kind of sampling ideas. Um, right, and, and uh, so there's lots of different like attempts to metrics. And maybe the last thing I'll end, <clears throat> since many of us have you know, day jobs as educators, so, you know, um, you know, this started off as an undergraduate thesis problem in 2013, or actually an undergraduate summer project with Christy Bond, who went on to get a PhD at Princeton in applied math, actually. Um, and there's been just a slew of undergraduate summer students and research students working with me and my group, all the people UG or undergrads and the MS or master students. And the entire class we taught with them, some members of the public policy school about this for a year long course or two. And these are all the students who did research projects in that course. And there are some collaborators. And I should just say one time if you want to know more about this, we have a blog, Quantifying Gerrymandering at Duke. And lots of these things are written up in short little blog posts. You can read about what we've done. And um, I'm very thankful to. Uh, Provost, uh, the information, the data science team, and the, uh, the public policy school for supporting our work. Lots of public. So uh, there you go. That's that's what I have to say. But I'm really happy to get questions either now or afterwards. Yeah, so people, I mean, uh, I mean, okay, so, so, so you want to get certified in gerrymandering, get the uh, nighttime certificate in gerrymandering. Um, uh, there's a DeVry. So, uh, so, uh, okay, now back to the um, You can do this, of course, by actually trying to walk down hill towards a particular objective function. You know, hey, what's my objective function? I can do kind of an optimization. People were doing that. 
try to figure out like what the what the boundary is to the radius, right? Right? Um, and what's possible. So you could do that, which people do. We've done it actually, um, just to get kind of outline edges. Um, yeah, I mean the other thing you do is you very simply do the following. You try to take places that you know that your party is going to use, and you try to pull as many other people of that party into that district. And then you try to spread out your people just enough to win the districts you can. Right, you have to be careful because you can't do that too much because eventually the political climate shifts, right? So what is yeah, so how do you think ultimately given that there's politics, so how should mm. what should be the procedure here? So how can we believe? That the politicians would allow and say, or the public, well, we have computer decides how. No, no, no. Yeah, I, it, it sounds like a Doctor Who episode to me, right? Like, you know, okay. There's like some computer that spits out the answer, and then 10,000 years in the future, so it's spitting out ridiculous answers and everything. I think that's not good, but right. you want. Uh, yeah, so, so okay, there's, there's, there's a couple answers to that. Yeah, there's, there's a couple answers to that. So, um, there's lots of answers to that. So, so in many states now, there are there are attempts to put nonpartisan or bipartisan redistricting commissions and limit what they can use. And so maybe they are less exactly informed about the details, and maybe they act as better actors. That's one thing. Um, another thing is to have automatic checks, where you kind of try to put up some comparisons so that that's part of the procedure. So, and if and if people are going to deviate from what one would typically see with some list of criteria. They should have to justify that. And there may be perfectly good reasons to justify that, right? Like maybe I didn't put anything in North Carolina about the protection of the Lumbee Indian Reservation. And maybe that's important. And maybe you want to keep that community of interest whole. And so maybe putting that into my thing would change it all. And so maybe we should do that. And that's fine. But then we should, you know, check. Um, I think another interesting thing that happened in North Carolina, which I was against at first, but I think I changed my mind. Um, it's not perfect when it's done right. It wasn't done right each time it was done. But they start off with a random map drawn by some method. And they brought it in and they put it down. And then everyone had to, by amendment, modify this map and explain why they were doing it. Now, of course, people were bad actors, of course, sometimes. And they went away and did some work somewhere else and came back and said, I'd like to change. You know, but at least they had to go on the record explaining why they were changing and how they were changing it and give some lip service to some reason, right? Um, which then could be audited a bit better. So that's another thing. Um, I mean, one thing that could also happen is that we could have more explicit statements, like maybe we'll be in the law that's bouncing around in Congress right now um, about you know uh, that we should have maps that don't give undue, undue bias or undue power to one side or the other based on what one would typically see in that state. Right? So you can have conversations like that and we can use methods like this. I don't like the idea of setting one of these methods as the gold standard to always use. I think it's an evolving subject, but I think that that's a, that's a possibility. And then there's the other answer, which is that, you know, that's those, all those answers were, how do we make the current system we have maybe run a little better? We could then change the system. You know, we could go to ranked order voting, we could go to some type of overlapping districts, which historically were used to disadvantage certain minority groups. But if you do it right, you might be able to make it multi-person districts. You could try to make it in a way that, 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 that didn't do that, right? Try to safeguard them. And those have some other advantages, maybe, right? Um, I have Sorry. Right. Um, I mean, first of all, it makes this analysis more complicated. So we've never done California because they have a hard time telling you have you don't have an easy way to decide who people would vote for, right? Because everyone's labeled the same party. Right? That's another thing that's interesting in kind of first through the gate, whatever it's called, it's called the jungle project. So Um, but uh, that's where just you have a primary and the top two vote getters run in the next election, regardless of what party they're in. Right. 
Well, that's not what you're asking, but it's kind of helps provide it helps push away from the simple two party system. You know, I, I don't know. Um, there's a lot of evidence that could be better in some ways, but I mean, there's also issues. I mean, there's definitely gerrymandering in the UK in certain ways, um, right? And they have coalitions. In Canada, it's usually, it's, there's a national redistricting commission, there, but there is, are examples of redistricting at the local level, which I think they forgot what their name was. There's a city council person in Vancouver, I think, who they want to design the district to so that she can be on. So, um, good. I, I, thank you. I, 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 it's great. There's a lot of questions. Um, I actually not understand what you're looking at. Uh, I do think that uh, most a politician yeah. would accept the ensemble approach. Yeah. So, how does it vary? But then, they will ask, uh, what are the policy constraints um, that you're putting on them? And you're saying you're beginning to do that. Yeah, I mean, I think we're very. How, how many people are doing that? I mean, how common is that now in the uh, redistricting consultant world? Right. And, uh, what, uh, how many different policy um, considerations? Yeah, so there's some groups that are being more focused about policy constraints, policy considerations. Some of them are doing it in a way which I think is less desirable. They're just putting kind of worst case exclusion, like you never will have it be less than half of this. We'll never, we'll only consider districts that have at least this much you know, minority representation. So we will never, so they kind of put pressure, but they don't think about how internal to that constraints there might be biases. So um, there's one or two people who is the way we do it. I mean, this is how we were some one of the first groups doing it. So one other group for sure. So they were the other early group doing this. Um, some of the other groups don't actually even know what they're sampling from. They don't actually know what their district is doing. So they're just looking at kind of gross statistics and saying, I think that it's long term. I think, I mean, I think there's a benefit for the conversation, although slightly technical. And kind of saying like, hey, these are the things we care about. These are the things we're going to put in our benchmark standard. And then we're going to, you don't actually have to think about like how what numbers will look like. You just say like, oh, we want it less like that, more like that. And then you tune the parameters so you get less like that, more like that. You know, you can look at the different systems. And I think that's a good com policy conversation to have, right? Like we want to have this thing above all like this, and then we'll tune the next parameters next. It's an order of how you should tune it. Right. And I think that that would then help the conversation a lot. Right. I think that would also help maybe take some of the political rancor out of it. You know, the people use it. I mean, like in some places, they all of a sudden got rigid about preserving uh, city boundaries. And not surprisingly, because it helps their heart. Right. Um, and, th and that's maybe, you know, okay, that's fine. I think that's an improvement at least. That's at least kind of, then we can have a conversation about do we care that much about preserving city boundaries to that effect over preserving certain types of communities in it? Or alternatively, why did you preserve city boundaries in this map and not preserve city boundaries in this one, right? Um, yeah. So, am I starting to answer your question? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, I know all of these different variables and I know the different policy variables. No. There are lots of them. There are. Uh, and they would be applied differently. So, for yeah. example, um, you're not going to draw a district um, that makes sure there's an even distribution of age yeah. uh, of the vote. Yeah. But it would be not unreasonable to make sure that every district had a large enough minority of either senior citizens who are always going to be interested in social security or younger voters who presumably will always be interested in having schools uh, schools or uh, uh, you know at a you know uh, free tuition right. or perhaps or perhaps uh, uh, low mortgage rates uh, so that they'll be able to buy a home for their family yeah uh, i mean i think 
things like that. And so if you have enough of them in each district that no representative can ignore their concerns, even though they'll never be a majority, uh, there are enough seniors or enough young people that the uh, that representatives cannot ignore them and hit. Yeah. Uh, because it's always going yeah, to that may not be possible. Uh, then, then you, that may not be possible. Then you have to take the function different for those two. I agree. For I agree. race, because of the law, that has to be a rigid boundary. You, uh, well, I mean, I understand. There, the, there the are jurors, the jurors, there's jurors from the Supreme Court that very much lose the case. Right? You've got it. But before that, even there was jurisprudence of black men. Yeah, but that if you look at the North Carolina district that followed the interstate, yeah. that narrow thread that went through there, that was not thrown out because of an imbalance between Republicans and Democrats. Oh, it was race. It was thrown out right. because of race. But that was Covington. That was Covington. And at the yeah. remedial phase of Covington, the courts accepted only 44% African American and 32% African American. Two voting rights act districts. Yeah. So they did not have a majority plus one African American in the district. That's, that had been the previous standard. But and the standard was weakened in recovery. In, in recent decades, as you're figuring out, I learned a lot of law in the last five years. In recent decades, with districts, districting that has been thrown out yeah. has been because of race, not because of imbalance between Republicans and Democrats. Most of the time. Well, it's um, the two, case but, in Pennsylvania and the case in North Carolina. Uh, so. Now, the other question, I, I think somebody was asking, but let me ask it and if it's cool or not. Yeah. Um, in a country that has two, uh, two parties that are more or less centrist, yeah. which is the way the United States used to be, and is still compared to a lot of other countries. Um, we think the Republicans and the Democrats are really on opposite poles. Um, it's turned more toward the center than the Italian communists and the Mexicans. Uh, um, in that case, you might want to be looking at Kind of a multi party system in this country where you've got uh, your rank not just on whether they're R's and D's, but whether they are liberal R's, moderate R's, conservative R's, yeah. or liberal D's, moderate. And you know, you could have a six party um, system, so to speak, even though. I, I mean, I agree with you very much. I mean, I, I think those, I think, I think part of the problem is that right now we're trying to get better districts. And I think that it's a really interesting question. I think I want the perfect one is that it may not really be possible. And, in, and in one of the things that's interesting about this method and this way of thinking, it's like there was an analysis that the, the Moons group did at, in, 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 uh, in Massachusetts where they showed that even though there are 30 something percent Republicans in Massachusetts, you can't draw a congressional district for those. It's never good. It's not possible given the Constraints, the other typical constraints in the state to draw another district. And it's not that the other constraints are unreasonable. It's just that they're too spread out across the whole state. Right. So, so I mean, that's also an interesting thing that can be brought to you. So, I know that in places, I've been talking to some people in a state, um, in some state, where they want to use this to actually bring to their coalition partners who they believe have such divergent agendas that are unrealistic. That there actually isn't a way to do all the things that everyone at the table wants to have done in a set of history. It's not really probably possible. Yeah, and, and so they want to kind of say, like, okay, look, some of these things are going to have to be given up. Can we all, at least the majority, disagree on what the things we give up first are and what the things we give up last are, right? And it, that helps sharpen the conversation. So I think, you know, this can be, these kind of ideas can be helpful there, right? I mean, before we were doing this, I think a lot of the analyses didn't really take in this spatial structure of the state very much at all. Yeah. 
take one per day tomorrow. Yeah, it's one And we don't see bimodal very often. We do see some widows and stuff like this, right? So we're not in that regime. Um, but uh, I mean, yes, you're right. But I think I think the fact is is that that thinking is where you're in a low dimensional space, and those are lined up on certain axes. I'm in a super high dimensional space, and it's not so clear how how lined up these are in the same direction, right? And so that kind of effect is heavily mitigated by. Yeah, because you can kind of sit, there's a lot of volume out there for you to sit in and being in one well doesn't necessarily include the community, right? I mean, geometry is kind of interesting in the past. All different other algorithms that I would like to do that I can't do yet because I don't have any reversal. You have dice to develop. So, dice to Yeah, so let's thank Thomas again.